On the other hand, I am confident that what I will testify about today would be corroborated if Mr. Christopher Coates were allowed to comply with his subpoena. In fact, I would encourage the Commission to broaden its inquiry and subpoena individuals who recently left the Department, who no longer work there over the last four years and worked within the voting section, because they too, I believe, would corroborate the testimony I'm going to give today. Other current employees also could corroborate the testimony because I have absolute confidence that the deeper that your inquiry about matters I will speak about goes, the greater the certainty that I am describing matters accurately. Mr. Boland, one of my attorneys, has worked with the department as well, as well as Mr. Jim Miles, who's not here today, who tried to reach a resolution. Mr. Miles could not be here because he's actually in Alaska until the snow starts to fly, so your schedule will not permit him to be here. This matter has resulted in me paying attorneys, and I wish that the parties had reached a resolution that fully respected the legal obligations of the individual subpoenaed. Finally, for the record, I want to point out that the Department has previous, previously allowed Mr. Christopher Coates to appear before this very Commission pursuant to a subpoena in 2008. Moreover, the Department has permitted line attorneys to testify before Congress on at least three occasions. Chief John Tanner in the voting section went before the House Judiciary Committee in October 2007. Line attorney Jerry Hebert appeared before the Senate Judiciary Committee on March 18, 1986 to oppose the nomination of Jeff Sessions to the District Court in Alabama. The next day, Paul Hancock, another voting section line attorney, appeared with Barry Kowalski, a deputy in the criminal section, and Daniel Bell, another deputy in the criminal section, to provide helpful, excuse me, to provide evidence unhelpful to Mr. Sessions' nomination to the United States District Court in Alabama. Therefore, I am here and ready to provide you as much information as possible. Thank you. Uh, I do want to point out that although I understand your assertion of uh, privilege relating to the uh, decision making within the Department of Justice, this commission is not necessarily bound. But that said, let's proceed. Um, there are two main issues that I, I want to address today. First is obviously the Black Panther uh, matter, uh, the case, and the, what happened in that case. Also about um, about what you have described as the open and pervasive hostility within the, within the Justice Department to bringing civil rights cases against non-white defendants on behalf of white victims. But to start with, let's go through some of the Black Panther matter. As the chairman pointed out uh, on Election Day in Philadelphia in 2008, um, there was an incident outside the Fairmont Street um, polling place. How did you become involved in that incident? Well, at the time, I was an attorney in the voting section in Washington. Normally on, on Election Day, uh, the department sends attorneys all over the country, as well as federal observers <clears throat> and as well as other observers, to monitor the election. I would ballparked that we had somewhere between 400 and 700 just ballparking uh, attorneys around the country and, and federal observers that day. I was back in Washington to help coordinate the uh, information flow of incidents as they arose throughout the country on November 4th, 2008. So that's how the matter came to my attention. Now we've had several witnesses who were present at, at Fairmont Street and they indicate that Department of Justice lawyers, part of a roving team, met with them on election day to take some statements. Do you know who those individuals were? I, I do not actually. I, I, uh, I knew that there was a team deployed to Fairmont Street and uh, but I don't know who the individuals were. Do you know whether those individuals took written statements from any of the witnesses? I know they took statements from the witnesses. Did you actually see them? Uh, I, I did not. Okay. Um, as you became involved in the matter, did you meet with and take uh, notes with regard to any of the witnesses that you spoke with? Of course. There's, of course. I, any attorney would do that. We have asked for those statements and the department has indicated that they're not going to turn them over. It's been extremely frustrating. Can you tell us whether those statements were straightforward fact statements, or did they also include legal analysis and your observations, or is it strictly the fact fact finding? I'm going to have to object because he's again delivered a process to the case. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 you're getting into the mechanisms of how the department conducts an investigation, um, and and the particulars of uh, you know what what records there are, the existence of records. The department has asserted as somehow privileged just the mere listing of what's there. So, I mean, you're, you're getting uh, to an area that I can't be very helpful in. Do you have uh, the exhibits in front of you, Ms. Court Reporter? 
let me uh, ask you to look at the uh, exhibit A, I'm which is sure. the J memo. Oh. Yeah. And we have obtained exhibit A as part of our investigation into this matter. And the um, J memo is, is an attempt to summarize uh, what the trial team is finding with regard to a case and to suggest uh, particular action and approval by uh, higher ups. Is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, adjust, it's, it stands for justification. Every case that the voting section brings, uh, you produce a justification memorandum. Okay. Now, this memorandum has, uh, as indicates, that it is from Chris Coates, Robert Popper, yourself, and Spencer Fisher. Is that right? That's what it says. And um, is it fair to say at that time <coughs> that each of those four individuals, including yourself, supported the, the uh, recommendation of the J memo? It's customary practice in the department that you do not attach your name to a document that you disagree with. And each, okay. So in each of four of those individuals, Mr. Coates, Mr. Popper, yourself, and Mr. Fisher, they're all career employees, correct? That is correct. Did, um, in preparing the lawsuit, did the department consider any criminal charges? Again, that's something I'm not going to answer. Okay. The fact is that you sought, the suit sought remedies under a Section 11B of the Voting Rights Act. Correct? 11B is a civil provision uh, in the um, Voting Rights Act of 1965. In preparing the suit, did you all, you, the trial team, have any concerns about the First Amendment uh, having any implications in a Section 11B case? Well, <clears throat> I'll speak broadly, but not specifically. The First Amendment is, is of course, an issue in any case involving elections, politics, speech. Um, where, the, where the boundaries of the First Amendment concerns start and stop is often a very difficult issue. Um, and I, I don't want to belabor the, the jurisprudence here, but you clearly have to consider uh, First Amendment issues when you're dealing with any form of political speech or activity. If you look at the U.S. v. Brown case, for example, which the Fifth Circuit affirmed, and I'll get to in greater detail later, um, <clears throat> the defendants in the U.S. v. Brown case asserted a fifth, uh, First Amendment defense to their blatant racial discrimination against white voters in Mississippi. <clears throat> so uh, oftentimes, or at least in that instance, the assertion of the First Amendment was suspect from the beginning, uh, but nonetheless they asserted it. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals took up the First Amendment defense in that particular case and said it was meritless, that when you break the law in and of itself, when you're breaking the law through an act that is separate from the First Amendment, um, that is satisfactory to proceed against that breaking of the law, and the First Amendment concerns or defenses exist outside of the civil action to remedy the law breaking. And in that particular case, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals agreed with the position of, 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 of mine, and, uh, and, and held that there was no First Amendment defense to stop what Ike Brown was doing in Mississippi. The defendants named in the Black Panther case included the two individuals at the polling uh, place, King Samir Shabazz and Jerry Jackson. But the, uh, the complaint also pursued um, action against the party itself, the new Black Panther Party, and Malik Zulu Shabazz. What was the basis of naming the latter two in this lawsuit? Mm -hmm. Well, I would turn to, I would suggest you look at the complaint. Uh, the complaint makes allegations that, uh, for example, <clears throat> Malik Zulu Shabazz, who's the National Party Chairman of the New Black Panther Party, was responsible for in, uh, organizing the deployment and, more importantly, uh, endorsed the use of the weapon after the deployment occurred. Um, that, and, and to, to paraphrase the, the allegation, that he was aware that a weapon was used, and that's just how it had to be. And for somebody to assent to that sort of illegal behavior uh, as the chairman of an organization would tend, uh, in, in, as Mr. Katz has testified to you, uh, create an agency liability for Shabazz.